And this is Ken Kratzer for CVSI and CVSI Talking Business, our opportunity to talk with leaders in the field of digital transformation, business education, banking, insurance, and all to highlight our team at CVSI, we provide insurance-based benefits to the credit card and payments industry. Now, today, we are really glad to be back with our friend, uh, that is Zena Ugrinsky, who is the CEO and founder of Genre X Incorporated, and also the co-founder of a private investment uh, group called Pilot Wave Holding, where she specializes in the energy segment. Zena, how are you today? I'm great, Ken. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure always. And uh, uh, one of your topics um, in artificial intelligence, of which you are an expert, um, is chat gbt uh since it was released in november from open ai uh it is the topic at every uh business uh, uh digital transformation session and and meeting um tell us a little bit about you you could go back a ways with this and microsoft's efforts to uh to uh to implement this uh tell us a little bit about the origin uh that you've been following Absolutely. So I, I, I believe one understands, you know, the implications of, of new technology when one understands how it came to be. So uh, OpenAI was formed in 2015. Elon Musk the, was one of the founders. Um, he, he has since left, I think, in uh, 2018. But uh, people like Peter Thiel uh, of PayPal and... Um, uh, the the gentleman Andy uh, um, I'm sorry Sam Altman uh, from Y Combinator uh, these these folks got together and with some initial investment from AWS which no one ever hears about which is actually Amazon Web Services right started Open AI in an effort to do two things one to democratize access to AI. And two, to form ostensibly an organization that would sort of become the watchdog for, you know, preventing the dystopian future of a sentient computing, you know, eradicating humanity, right? So, the, and it was a nonprofit. And it switched to a for profit in 2019. And what it was doing was taking a natural language processing algorithm. So um, it, it was trained on essentially, well, they, they've, they've kind of stopped talking about all the data that went into it, but initially it was every book in the Smithsonian and everything that it could scrape from the internet. So if you think about that contextually, it's a, it's a mix of content of actually fact-checked things, fictional novels, and everything that's on the internet, which of course spans, you know, from factual evidence to opinions that are in some cases pretty radical. So um, fast forward to, or, or actually, uh, so they built the model and there have been you know, various iterations. It's built on an algorithm called GPT-3, technically GPT-3.5, which is, you know, various versions. And this is all um, just one model that has access to all of that data that is now trying to say, given what you have asked me, what is the most likely right result for your question. And um, so so when you think about the implications there, it, uh, it, it is going to be a mix of, of factual evidence and opinion, which makes it, you know, in the eyes of some folks, a little dangerous, right? Because people recognize the responses as it, it Sounds very authoritative. There are some facts that are true, but it is not consistently correct. So 
Um, so just to get back to the origin story, so we are now at a point where GPT-4 is coming out. That is expected to be an even more radical, uh, radically improved version. But why, why is GPT, uh, chat GPT such a big deal right now? It's the first time that this was released to the wild, okay? So they developed an interface where anyone can go and essentially play with it. So why is that important? When you go in and play with it, you see a thumbs up and a thumbs down. And what you're doing is participating in the training of this model. Right. Um, I'll just I'll just pause there and, and, and see if you have any questions uh, yeah, based on well, what I've said. We're hearing a lot from uh, the impact this may have on education. There are apps now with uh, uh, from uh, ChatGBT that uh, anyone can download and, and start doing what you described, uh, interacting, perhaps improving the system uh, with theirs. Um, there's uh, talk of um, this helping Microsoft with their search engine uh, and, and help them catch up to Google. What are, what are some of the ways that uh, you see this uh, ChatGBT making a, a difference? So let's, I think uh, the best way to answer that is to start with how this differs from traditional computing, okay? So because it is a very different application of computing power. So what we have traditionally used compute for is to build big databases of facts, okay? So for example, traditionally we build, you know, data warehouses, they're full of information that have been, each item of information has been fact checked and you know, it forms the basis of a common understanding of a company, for example, whether it's its financial returns, its legal history, um, any other narrative around product development. Um, so when you ask a data warehouse a question, you get facts back that have been checked and verified. So that is a deterministic model. GPT-3, the basis for chat GPT, is a probabilistic model. The only thing it does is evaluate statistically what is the next right word in this string of words that I am providing. It doesn't have context. It doesn't sit there and say, ah, you're asking a question about, you know, political science and like trying to compare these two doctrines, right? It will go grab whatever it can find about those doctrines, but it will add narrative around it, which in some cases can actually result in incorrect answers. Okay, so there's there's the difference between what we used to think of as compute and knowledge acquisition, right? This is not knowledge acquisition. This is this is a computer doing its best to give you what you think the what it thinks the right answer is. All right. Well, how do you see this affecting work? Um, you know, we work obviously with uh, digital ad agencies that are coming up with creatives and and for writers coming up with narratives, writing articles. Uh, um, and uh, education, customer service. I saw one note that said that they thought chat GBT could lower, um, and applying this artificial intelligence machine learning could cut customer service costs by 30%. Uh, how do you see this uh, working, uh, uh, chat GBT? So let's look at it from an industry perspective first. So I'll, I'll start with some industries where there are going to be some challenges uh, around applying this. And then I'll, I'll finish with marketing, which I know is of interest to, to your, uh, your audience. And sure. um, so when you think about what I defined as deterministic versus probabilistic um, you know, computing, there's already been a lot of chatter about, um, for example, uh, the law, 
law firms and accounting firms. Why? Because algorithms have already been built to go out and scour, for example, all of the contracts, the legal contracts held by a law firm and the results of various litigations, okay? So think, if you will, what, what is a first year law student typically doing? Well, they're, they're standing in a basement of filing cabinets and you know going through files to try to find anything that has some relevance to this case that they've been asked to do research on. Well, we're already at the point where, you know, companies that have already applied this have a database and an algorithm that is going after the right information. So the, the first year law student's role is already morphed to no longer standing there flipping through physical files, but doing a query and having the algorithm deliver back anything and everything that it thinks might be relevant to the question being asked, okay? So what does that leave for the first year law student to do? They have to check, they have to determine the relevance to the case that they're doing. This is a human function that the computer can't do, okay? Accounting, very similar, only we're adding numbers now. Um, very fact-based. You can't get this wrong, right, in those fields. Now, let's move over to marketing. Why is this useful for marketing? Well, because it, it does, it, it allows for the human to, to interpret the results around the things that uh, ChatGPT or GPT-3 or 4 will not do very well. Creativity, empathy, emotional intelligence. So when you think of the field of marketing, what are we trying to do? We're trying to present information that has a behavioral impact on human beings. So in that case, and I'll, I have an example that I, that I did only yesterday, um, no. it, it, in that case, it's an incredibly useful tool, right? Because you can ask it a question and say, what is the benefit of X, Y, Z to, you know, to a, a, uh, a group of moms in their 30s and 40s? And it will provide you all kinds of information. And then you as a human being are looking at it going, ooh, that's compelling, hadn't thought of that, right? This uh, clearly is wrong because it falls into the realm of, you know, it's just pulling words out of, out of probabilities and statistically jamming them together. Um, and, and so um, for marketing and for content creation, my daughter's a writer. Right? She's an editor. She has 10 writers that she's responsible for. These 10 writers are junior writers. They're not doing a very good job. So at this point, they could be very similar to, to what GPT, uh, chat GPT is delivering. And that makes, you could, essentially, you could eliminate five of those writers, use chat GPT, and my daughter is now just editing right? Content that did not come from humans. She as a human is doing a little fact checking, lining it up for conciseness, and then, you know, doing final edits as she would normally as an editor, and move on. What's, what's fascinating about, um, or one of the problems still inherent in chat GPT, is that you can ask it a question, and if it cannot find sufficient information to line your question up against it will be it will be um it will begin to synthesize information it's called the hallucination effect it will what then present what does that mean again to synthesize the uh, the information 
it will take your question and maybe it has, you know, a four part answer. And the first section is correct. Absolutely. In fact, like you're looking at it as a human, you go, yes, that is correct. The second answer, unfortunately, it just pulled out of thin air. But it is presented in such a way that it sounds factual. It sounds and it and it is presented in an authoritative sort of way. Like I am the expert on this, you know, topic, and here's the information. And um, there are still many, many cases in which that is completely wrong. But it's being presented to you with some authority, right? In in phrasing, in you know, context that as a human receiving it, it feels like like an authority is telling you this. And that is called the hallucination effect. And that has yeah. not, you know, that is still rampant. And I'll give you an example. First, I'll give you an example that ties to your marketing, folks. Um, I, I sit on the board of, uh, of a startup in the medical space, uh, physician education. And so I asked chat GPT, what is the value of doing physician education on cannabis? And it came up with some very good answers, right? Um, due to drug interactions, you want physicians to understand, you know, what's going on. And we were able to take that content. And by the way, I asked the same question like three or four times and got three or four different sets of answers, various combinations of the same content, but also some new content. And, um, and so we used that as, as, you know, some source material for some of the, the marketing materials, because it makes sense. We know it's correct. It came up with some additional perspectives that perhaps we hadn't thought of in the marketing deck. That's awesome. Now, I then went and said, write a bio on Zena Ugrinsky. There's enough information, you know, out there about me that it came back with three different versions. Now, because the last thing I had asked was healthcare specific, in the first answer, it crafted me as an expert in the healthcare space, which I am absolutely not. Okay. The second time around, I said, well, you know, give that to me again. And now I had um, actually uh, a master's in healthcare. And it listed specific organizations that I was a member of that I am not. Okay. Was that focusing on other people out there who may have the same name as you do, same spelling? Uh, linking together? It, it may be, but Zena Ugrinsky is not a very common name, nor oh, yeah. are either of them, right? So there may be a Zena out there that has a medical background. Yeah. So I, I figured, let me ask it a different way. I'll ask it, um, you know, Zena Ugrinsky, Chief Transformation Officer. Ah, now it went in a completely different direction. And now I have a PhD in engineering. And I belong to the United, you know, Association of Engineering, uh, which I do not. <laughs> you know? okay. So, so be aware that, you know, it is a great source for information. Um, however, it needs to be fact checked, and and so the the challenge. We're concerned about you have a confidence uh, concern then, and what the output could be. If you because it has no, it it doesn't understand why or the context that you're asking about. It is merely going back and looking at the body of words that it has access to and saying, you know, what combination of words is most likely to, you know, so answer this, this question. Useful if if um, if we're not sure the data is going to be, you know, is going to identify the right individual. So 
like doing searches today, you, uh, you know, it's only like the first dozen listings seem to have any value. And then you go off in all sorts of tangents. Um, is uh, where do you see this being useful in the short term? So in the short term, it's it's going to be what I would call sort of the starter point for content. That's why I said it's really, you know, I, I think this is going to get traction uh, in in marketing and content creation very quickly. I mean, you, you have reported um, frequently on sports events. And actually, sports journalism is one of the first areas that was impacted um, by bots just writing up, you know, like, here's the final score. Here is some information from about what yeah. happened in the game. Give me, give me the game, you know, review, right? And, and so it's already used for things like that. Not, not chat GPT, but something similar. Um, earlier iterations, Google. You know, I'll tell you an example of that because it happens all the time. You know, you, we sometimes follow games by looking at the stats that are coming off of ESPN or other, other CBS, other platforms, and not actually watching. And then something happens that, you know, that doesn't get reported the stats, like a player is injured um, or somebody's not playing. Um, it's sometimes very hard to pick that up from stats. And you have, that's why you have to be there to, to see what's actually happening and talk to people but uh, not you, you have that absolutely right so for example any large event that could have meaning um because it's a new event will not likely even be reported then that's that's your example right there yeah now you said you, you know you um mentioned to me the uh microsoft goes uh, has been following, supporting ChatGBT, and some, and apparently there's they've made another big investment in the company. Some have said that it could help them in the search engine market with their Bing product, um, compare it, uh, improve its uh, its uh, its market share to uh, Google. You see that happening? I mean, the Google, the search engine capability uh, that ChatGBT may be able to bring. Well. I think it's. I think you have to look at each of the companies and what they are uh, really considered best at, right? So Google has a lock on search. Bing, you know, is uh, is probably as good in terms of what what comes back, but um, Google really has the brand and the market legacy for that space. Microsoft, I believe, is is looking at um, at GPT three and and has been working with these guys and you know candidly got in the door early. So they made uh, uh, I forget what year it was, but they put a billion dollars into it when it was startup when it was still a startup. Also, so they came after AWS. And what I find interesting is that no one ever talks about AWS's role in all of this, okay? But, you know, they're the architecture that most of this is sitting on because they brought it. Okay. Um, now, uh, from a product development standpoint, where is Microsoft taking this? Uh, I think I mentioned to you four years ago, I was uh, in, um, uh, at uh, uh, Pebble Beach at a New York Times uh, conference and um, sponsored by Microsoft. So we had the opportunity to start looking at some of the advanced product that Microsoft was coming out with. And um, what was fascinating was that it was able to edit in real time. So it was speech to text. So for example, I need to do a PowerPoint presentation. I'm just going to speak the bullets. Oh, and by the way, I need it in German as well. And so I will speak the bullets. It will record that on the screen and it will in real time begin to build the right sentences from a structural and syn syntactual standpoint. Um, as I'm speaking, 
So as I finish a sentence, it has been real time adjusting the prior words to give me the right German sentence by the time I finish saying the English sentence. So the, there are some amazing business um, implications for this. And, you know, now you can also say, well, Google's working on that too. They've got Google Translate. Google Translate's been out in the market for, you know, some time. But make no mistake, this is all about increasing revenue, right? What are the new products we can bring to market? For Microsoft, I believe uh, ChatGPT and GPT-3 and 4 are going to be incredibly important and an underpinning of what Microsoft will be releasing in terms of products. It's a natural extension, right? What do we, what do we interact with? Um, besides Windows as an operating system, we react with Office. It's all words and spreadsheets. It's all numbers. That's really um, its sweet spot. That, I believe, will be an accelerator for them in terms of product launch. Where has Google been in all of this? You don't hear anything. Now, does Google have something like this that they're developing? Of course they do. Why have they not gone the public route that Microsoft has. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, an outsider looking in, but I believe this is so disruptive to their business model, right? The margins on advertising click revenue are incredibly high. They can't just replace their business model with one that has a lower margin profile. So what I think they're gonna do, and here's, here's you know, prediction number one, is I think that Google will spin off, or like Alphabet, will spin off a new unit that will be a standalone company that will release its own sort of chat GPT lookalike, if you okay. will. Very good. Well. Uh... Dina Ugrinsky, fascinating to hear your insight into uh, this new capability that everybody is talking about. Everyone is looking at testing, getting a feel for uh, the chat GBT release in November uh, and uh, how it's going to affect search and uh, creativity and developing creative. And, uh, and all those teachers out there are a little worried about uh, how students are going to use this. Uh, yeah, final thought for today. Well, the, uh, the, the other prediction I'd like to make is that um, we talked about deterministic and probabilistic models and, and how, you know, traditional compute and this new type of computing. I believe that the, that the uh, silver bullet will be in the future how these come together. So I'll give you a, a, a practical sort of tactical example. So I believe that GPT, you know, dash version number will ultimately wind up being trained by deterministic models that whose sole function is to fact check everything that's coming out of GPT, you know, three, four, five. Right. And that's where we're going to start seeing an incredible leap in the reliability and the factual um, veracity of of the the results that are coming, which which now turns a corner in terms of how exponentially uh, applicable it will be going forward. OK, Gina. Zena Ugrinsky, uh, great to see you today and uh, hear um, what you're working on. Anything in particular, a project you'd like to highlight um, uh, for the audience? Well, uh, yeah, as, as uh, you said, I focus on the energy markets. And, um, you know, one of my passions is taking companies that are what you would consider traditional companies. So, you know, uh, infrastructure, road building, right? The the least technological 
technological companies on the planet and um, and help them to apply data science and analytics in a way that will push those industries forward. So I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm in energy, I'm in infrastructure and, uh, and you know, my, my passion is, is helping those industries grow, mature and catch up. Okay. Always great to talk with you, Zena Ugrinsky, who is a CEO and founder of Genre X Incorporated, also co-founder of a private investment company, Pilot Wave Holding, um, uh, which specializes in the energy segment. Uh, Zena, great to see you as always. We'll talk again very soon. Thank you, Ken. Always a pleasure to see you. Good to see you. And uh, and just uh, again, it's Ken Kreitzer for CBSI and CBSI Talking Business. We're always glad to uh, be able to recognize our team. We're based in Harrison, New York. We provide insurance-based benefits to the credit card and payments industry. And uh, look forward to another episode soon. Thanks for watching.